Securities and financial planning offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor. Member FINRA SIPC. The opinions voiced in this show are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, and financial advisor or tax advisor prior to investing. Welcome to Planning for Win Financial Guidance in Life. I'm Kevin Pinkley. Thank you for joining us today. Today we'll be discussing the importance of a prenuptial agreement. Um, and joining us today is Ernie Martin. He's a family law attorney. And thank you for joining us, Ernie. Thank you for having me. Could you tell us a little bit about your practice, Ernie, and then how the listeners could get in touch with you, please? Absolutely. Uh, I work for Courier and Martin. I'm a partner at Courier and Martin. We're a general civil practice firm here in Harris County. Uh, we specialize in really nothing. We're general civil. That means we do a great number of things. We handle things such as uh, personal injury cases, wills and probates, contracts review, real estate. And in my case, I focus primarily on family law. Okay, thank you. Well, so we introduced the topic of prenuptial agreements or prenups as commonly used out on the street, if we will. Where, where would you like to start with that topic? Well, first thing we want to talk about is what kind of agreements are out there? How do we make them? And then we can get into the wisdom of having one or not having one, depending on the situation. Uh, in Texas, there's, there's generally four types of agreements that can be made, uh, two of which would be made prior to marriage. First one is the premarital agreement or the prenuptial agreement, as people refer to them. There's also what we call a non-marital cohabitation agreement for the people who don't want to get married but want to live together and, you know, assign certain rights and duties. Uh, in addition to these, once people do get married, then they can enter into postmarital agreements. The primary postmarital agreement is referred to as a partition or exchange agreement. And then we also have this beast called a conversion agreement, which I think is a little bit more rare. Um, let's start with the, the, the premarital agreement or the prenup, as it were, and what that, what that document is and what does it do. And before we can even begin to talk about what a prenuptial agreement does, we have to kind of have an understanding of how property works in Texas as a result of divorce, okay? Uh, so many people have come to my office and gotten bad news. Uh, they really didn't understand any kind of marital laws before they got married. Uh, you know, watch TV, talk to their friends, these types of things. But when it comes down to how the laws really work, they really don't have a clue. Uh, what we have in Texas is a community property law state. That means everything that you own once you're married presumed to be community property, meaning you don't own it, your spouse doesn't own it, the marriage owns it or owes it, okay? There are, uh, there are exceptions to community property, and that's called separate property. It falls into three broad categories. These are items that a person owns before marriage. These are items that are acquired by a person during the marriage through an inheritance or through a gift. Those are your big categories. Also, certain personal injury proceeds are considered separate property. Um, so when the, when the court in Texas applies their quote-unquote just and right division of the community property so as to equalize the parties, that can be a pretty rude shock for a lot of people. A lot of people go into marriages thinking, as long as I earn the money, and I keep the money in my individual bank account, that money's mine. I worked, I've earned it. No, that's not true at all. Your income, your spouse's income, belongs to the marriage. So if you're in a situation where you're the primary breadwinner and your spouse might be making very little money, and you come in for a divorce and you think that you're going to walk away with the money that you made, you're wrong. You're wrong. In 
fact, the court might impose what we call a disproportionate split on those assets, leaving you with less than 50% of the assets and more than 50% of the debt. Well, what I'm hearing you say, Ernie, is that in our marriages and relationships, even if we're not married, we might have our ground rules, if you will, or what's normal for us and and how we go about our daily activities and, and how we manage our household. But when it comes time that there's a divorce, we're playing by someone else's rules and regulations. And in a lot of cases, that's a shock and uncomfortable, but that's the way it is. And in a lot of cases, um, things don't go the way they think they're going to go um, with these division of assets, right? That's yeah. correct. That's correct. Um, a lot of people will complain. Mm-hmm. They, they talk about the laws in Texas being unfair. Uh, listen, it just depends on your personal philosophy and your station in life, whether the law is fair or not in your circumstances. But I can tell you this, the legislature has no sympathy. One of the reasons that the legislature has no sympathy is because Texas does allow parties to contract around the community property laws. In other words, if you don't like the laws on the book, make your own, which is an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing. You have to get educated. You have to understand what it is that you have and what a divorce can do, and then you can contract around and make more reasonable, more fair agreements that mm-hmm. suit the parties involved. Uh, now, don't attempt this at home, meaning <laughs> <laughs> these agreements are very technical. They must be in writing. They must be just so. There are certain elements that must be contained in these things to make them enforceable. If all the hoops are jumped through, though, they are highly enforceable. In fact, when the prenuptial agreement has been done properly, There's a presumption in favor of the prenuptial agreement, okay? So the law is on your side. If you have a prenup, the court's going to look at ways to enforce that agreement, okay? Uh, Like I said, there are certain technical aspects that have to be followed, uh, some of which we'll talk about, some of which kind of go beyond the scope of this conversation today. But understand rule number one, verbal agreements don't work. So you can have these verbal arrangements with your spouse, either you make them before marriage or after marriage, they don't mean anything. Well, you, you know, it's interesting you mentioned verbal agreements. I, I brought material today. So yesterday I had a phone call from someone that I know quite well, and this couple is well beyond their second marriage. So they have had a lot of experience um, in this area, and some things have worked well in the past and some things haven't, and it was quite a surprise. So now, supposedly, with this new marriage, they have everything worked out, they've learned from their past mistakes, and they've sat down and verbally agreed to what will happen, what won't happen, uh, to work work out all the details. And so I listened to this conversation for about 30 minutes, and then at the end of it, I said, so nothing's in writing, right? And she said, correct. And I said, well, all y'all had is a conversation, and I hope it works out, but if you experience in the future what you've experienced in the past, it's all for naught. And, um, you, you know, it's interesting, you know, people are still trying to work around the system, if you will, the rules or regulations. And if they just spent a little bit of time and visited with someone like yourself or the other people that are available, um, these issues then are in print and you tuck it in a drawer and you don't ever worry about it again. Uh, but if something does happen, then all your wishes are on paper and then no questions and no gray area. So, That's correct. Yeah. It, it provides predictability, mm-hmm. right? And it provides security, in my opinion, anyway. Um, now, again, these documents, they have to be fair. Mm-hmm. Okay, now fair is in the eye of the beholder to a certain extent, but ultimately, ultimately, a judge could have a finding that the premarital agreement or the postmarital agreement is unconscionable, meaning it's just so one-sided as to not be fair that it's against public policy. And in that situation, they can choose not to enforce that, and then they would just apply the community property rule. So again, visiting with a lawyer on Mm -hmm. these things rather than trying to do them at home is a wise thing because, again, you might make an agreement, go live your life, 
the next 10 years based upon what you thought would be enforceable mm-hmm. and turns out now you've, you've been treading on smoke for the last 10 years sure. and that's all you had um it's 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 pretty amazing this is kind of a story i like to tell people i've been practicing family law for 20 some years at this point i have seen people spend tens of thousands of dollars on weddings mm-hmm. you know all the bells and whistles all the arrangements all the festivities uh, i've had one client come in and visit with me before they got married about what it is they're getting themselves into in other words, what are the community property rules in this state, or what are the rules in this state? Um, that would save people a lot of grief if they understood that going into the marriage, and then they can go into it eyes wide open. Now, you mentioned people who are on their second marriage, maybe their third marriage, that type of thing. Okay, shame on them. They've been through it. Right. All right. So they should know better. Uh, you know. Now, some of them, you know, some people go out, they get married very young. Their marriage doesn't last very long. They never accumulated very much. They go through one of these quick divorces, no muss, no fuss, because there's no property. Right. Okay. So they really didn't learn anything about what divorce really is like. But when you come into a marriage owning real estate, owning retirement accounts and brokerage accounts, uh, you, you have money out there working, earning dividends and interest. These become very, very complex divorces very quickly which also means that complex equals expensive. Exactly. Okay. Well, I wanted to add to your examples. Um, I've evolved on this issue of, of these different types of agreements prior to marriage. Um, and we'll talk about different examples later. But originally, I thought they weren't needed at all because two adults could work that out. And then, again, as you said, after 20-some-odd years of a practice, you see what works and what doesn't work and what creates problems and gray areas, and it's not having those agreements in place. So um, when there's issues and when we spend a lot of time on the legal side or the financial side, um, in a lot of cases, it's because people left these gray areas open. And in some cases, um, things can't work out the way they thought they would. Uh, Assets are lost altogether. and sometimes these assets are dollars, and sometimes there's assets with history. I mean, they could be property, they could be the lake house, all, all different types of things. And we tend to spend more time, which, as you said, means more money, with people who don't have these agreements. And if they were in place, it would speed up the process, which means less time, which means less of a bill. And I mean, I don't know if you have, but have you ever worked on a really long, messy, expensive divorce that had a prenup? No. Okay. Well, strike that. Yeah. I'm working on one right now that I hope will get settled quickly. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, and this kind of gets into the different kinds of agreements that a person can make. In that particular instance, the parties chose parties agreed that certain items of their marriage will be separate property Mm -hmm. and any mutations on those items any earnings from those items would remain separate property so that's a good thing uh, from the standpoint of clearing away some of the brush but at the same time they did choose to create a community estate Mm -hmm. so income from earnings from from working uh, that's community property Purchases from that income, community property. Mm-hmm. This can create even a bigger mess. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm learning. That's why I still learn even after 20-some years. Uh, this can create even a bigger mess than if they had no prenup at all, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, now, again, I hope that that case goes smoothly. I hope that that case can settle. Uh, but at the same time, there's no slam dunk here. Mm-hmm. Typically speaking, on a prenup, and now I'm somewhat adamant about clients no community estate is created and it'll say that repeatedly throughout the agreement what am i holding up here about 50 pages at least some pages. Yep. Yep. this is kind of a sample prenup uh it's a form and again any attorney that says oh i don't use forms i just write them myself walk out of that office as quickly as you can 
you want an attorney that is going to use approved language from the uh, State Bar of Texas Family Practice Manual because it's been tried and true. Okay? Um, so again, a lot of people will, most people will say, okay, we don't want to have a community estate. Everything is going to be separate property. That means all the property that I own going into this marriage is going to be mine. We're going to draw it up. It's going to be itemized. It's going to be right there and disclosed. Any earnings, any mutations on that property is mine. Any property that I acquire in the future in my name or that I can prove was mine uh, will be my separate property as well. There just is no community estate. My income is mine. Mm -hmm. Those types of agreements, when done correctly, can result in what we call a summary judgment. A summary judgment is a device used in the law where the a party can assert to the court, there is no fact issue here. So rule as a matter of law that there's no fact issue to dispute and grant me my divorce based upon my prenuptial agreement. Absolutely. That's the way they're designed to work. And if we do them right, summary judgment is available remedy, which means you probably, even a hotly contested divorce, could end in as little as about 90 days. Mm -hmm. Okay? Maybe even less, depending on how quickly you can get everything together and do a judge. Okay, um, but when we have premarital agreements that do create a community estate or allow a community estate to exist, then there are fact issues. Well, how much income does the person have? What did you buy with that income? What's out there that I don't know about? And again, you're off to the races. You're going to be in a contested divorce that's going to charge by the hour. It's going to go on for month after month after month, possibly year after year. Okay. Uh, so again, in my opinion, on a, on a uh, premarital agreement, I think you are, should not create a community estate. Now we get into the question of why. You know, right. Why get married? Listen, we have four schedules typically on a, on a premarital agreement four lists, okay? Schedule A is typically the husband's assets that they own. Schedule B would be the wife's assets. Schedule C would be the husband's assets. Schedule D would be, excuse me, the husband's debts. Schedule D would be the wife's debts. Schedule E. <laughs> Schedule E. <laughs> Jointly owned property. Property that the parties might own before they get married together mm -hmm. or property that they might acquire after marriage that they decide to jointly own. So again, these documents can be very, very fair just depending on the people. But let's just say that I want to keep my separate stuff separate, but I'm not opposed to buying property with my spouse. Maybe some investment property, maybe that vacation home. Okay. So again, we can jointly own it. It just will be divided probably differently or could be divided differently than what a divorce court might do with community property. Community property is subject to disproportionate splits. Jointly owned property, if we spell out who did what, usually 50-50. Or maybe they might do it by contribution. Contribution would be, you know, hey, I put in $100,000 in this property, you put in 20. So I get my 100, you get your 20. That's fair. Mm -hmm. That's fair. And again, it's just Whatever the whatever the parties want to do, whatever they think is fair, we can do that. I, I wanted to mention something. So um, there might be listeners out there. I know I, I run into them, and I know Ernie does. That this far into a conversation about prenuptials, somebody is maybe thinking, "Yeah, that sounds good for some people, but I don't need that because maybe of my experience, my background, my education, maybe our net worth." meaning I'm not the type of person who would be susceptible to that or uh, we'll work it out, uh, which frankly doesn't work, but um, they don't think that later on during their marriage they'll be influenced to do different things. And my message is just don't underestimate the amount of influence somebody can put on somebody, either pressure or indirect pressure, of doing things that they normally wouldn't without an agreement or just over time. And it doesn't matter if you're 45 or 85. I've seen it happen with all age groups, all walks of lives. 
and, and even what I would call the hard cases where I had someone literally say to me, I'm not a weak person. I don't need an agreement like that. Many years later, this person who's not a weak person w wished very much that, you know, they had signed a document with a few pieces of paper outlining what was separate property, what was community property, because during the next 20 some odd years, a lot of things changed and um, it just didn't work out the way they think they did, they anticipated. So um, in most cases, um, I think everyone should seriously consider this because it makes a difference and um, it, it just creates, takes care of all the gray areas, if you will, because those gray areas are going to come up in the divorce and not everyone's going to agree to it. And you're just going to spend a lot of time trying to work it out. Here's the simple way to look at it. If the weatherman says there's a 50% chance of rain, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Probably wear a hat or carry an umbrella or something because mm -hmm. you pretty much expect it to rain. Mm -hmm. There's a 50% chance of getting divorced. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Right. If there's a 60% chance of getting divorced or a 65% chance of getting divorced, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Those are real numbers. 50% of all first marriages end in divorce. Now, those numbers are shrinking, but experts believe that the numbers are shrinking because fewer people are marrying, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but 50%, 60%, 65%, and again, the odds just keep getting worse for you the more times you get married. So again, with those statistics that are real, mm -hmm. it only makes sense to say, okay, let's look at how we would divide things in the event of a divorce. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't mean that you're going to get divorced. It just means, as your title of your show, planning for when. Okay? <laughs> um, and, you know, planning for if or when. Because, yeah. um, again, 50% of the marriages stay together, mm -hmm. right? And there you go. But, again, <clears throat> how does it change the marriage if you have a prenup? And, in my opinion, it doesn't have to change it at all. In fact, it makes it a little bit more solid mm -hmm. because a leading cause of divorce is financial strife, right? particularly when you have one party who feels like they're pulling the oar all by themselves. I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've worked, I've sacrificed, I've done this, I did that. My spouse sat on the TV, watch, you know, sat on the couch and watched mm -hmm. TV. Um, and again, it's like a bad business partner. If, if you're getting into business with somebody, you're going to do that just on a verbal handshake. Most people know. Most people are going to say, hmm, let's go talk to a lawyer. Maybe we should get a business agreement, some type of agreement, partnership agreement, whatever the case may be, that's going to spell out terms, mm -hmm. not just for how you conduct yourselves during the life of the business, but if the business unwinds, falls apart, how are you dividing things up? Well, I wanted to mention another example. Um, someone explained it to me that it's another way to leverage your time or money. And I didn't really understand what they were saying at first. And this was a very successful businesswoman prior to her marriage. And they did not have a prenup. And later there was a divorce. So there was substantial assets that everyone was looking at post-marriage and pre-marriage. And so we had our first meeting uh, with the businesswoman and the rest of her team. There were a lot of people in the room, which means the clock's running. It means people are getting paid. And about an hour in the meeting, she said, well, um, if I would have had a prenup, it basically would have been the cost of this meeting. <laughs> and that was the first meeting. And so this divorce went on for months and months and months and took a little more than a year. And that was kind of the hard way to understand. There was a cost. It's a nominal cost for the prenup when, when we are considering what we're talking about. But it took her real quick to realize, hey, the clock's been running for about an hour and a half. We probably wouldn't even be here talking about these things if I had had the prenup. Uh, so it saves a lot of time and a lot of money. And um, this person was very in tune with time and money. And um, But, you know, some people do realize that Hopefully, people will realize it before there's a need for it. There's a there's a laundry list, a long laundry list of reasons that a prenuptial agreement or a property agreement are good things. And one of those is to protect wealth, mm -hmm. not just for you, mm -hmm. but for your heirs. Okay. Right. 
uh, again, when you understand the community property laws and how complex those can be, again, you might have an heirloom piece of property. Okay, and the court says, okay, yeah, sure, that's your separate property. We can't divide that. Mm -hmm. But we can order a big reimbursement on it, depending on if the marriage, if any marital income improved that property at all, or if that property earned any income during the marriage. I have a had a client who, you know, I always have to check these things, and I was pretty sure I knew the answer. She owned a rental property. It was hers from her first divorce, first marriage, and the first divorce. So she remarries, and second marriage is about 10, 13 years, somewhere in there. But she had been earning rent on that house the whole while. She kept the house and she didn't live in it. Well, yeah, investment income, right? Well, guess what? What is investment income? Well, income is community property. Right. So she's putting the money back into the house, but it's lowering the note on that house. So she's improving her separate estate with community money. Well, now she owes a big fat reimbursement to her husband on property that was hers. Mm -hmm. And again, a prenup would have solved that. It would have made it so much easier. Her divorce would have been so much easier and less expensive because originally, you know, we're going to fight, fight, fight for this. Mm -hmm. But then the writing was on the wall that we're not going to win this one. You had mentioned heirs, and I had an example, which I didn't imagine prior to being involved in this, where um, a couple had a prenup. Uh, they were both in the, separately successful prior to their second marriage. Um, and the prenup was beneficial, and the couple was never divorced. Uh, they were married a long time, over 20 years. The prenup was just there, just in case. Um, there were family member, very large families on both sides of the family. Unfortunately, they both were killed in a car accident. And then the heirs literally come out of the work woodwork. So the combination of their estate planning and the prenup cleared up all the disagreements that were there because each family member had a different interpretation of what was mom's or what was dad's or what was part of the estate. And each one of them, for the most part, hired legal counsel. But this couple had everything tucked away in a drawer that they thought they'd never need. Unfortunately, they did. But that was an example of, I think it was beneficial, and they were never divorced. So um, you just never know. That's right. Yep. That's right. And it's it's kind of like you said, look, you make the agreement, mm -hmm. you stuff it in your safe deposit box, and you forget about it, mm -hmm. and you go on about your life, mm -hmm. and you don't worry about that. Now, if we're being astute, one thing about marital agreements, premarital and postmarital agreements, are they're actually living, breathing documents, mm -hmm. okay, just as a will can be well, last will and testament. Uh, so from time to time, that agreement might need to be updated, mm -hmm. okay? And again, it's just for specificity purposes, okay? Uh, a piece of property is acquired, but there's really no proof of who bought it, mm -hmm. who owns it. You know, when they're out antique shopping, they come across this painting they like, they pay cash for it, mm -hmm. no receipt. Who owns the painting? Right, right. Well, it's one of the others because there's no community estate. But who owns it? We don't know. Well, again, you break out the prenup, you put an addendum on there, you add the Schedule A. Everybody initials it, signs it. There you go. You're good to go. Let's address that. Let's take it care of. So again, you don't want to completely forget about them, but yeah, you don't want to sit there and let it dominate your life either. No, that makes sense. And I mean, um, your life is going to change during that time frame, so. Some cases, property and investments change, so it's just as you said, it's an update. That's so, right. That's right. Don't. Other things that uh, you know bear consideration in these kinds of agreements isn't just who owns what property, and, and, and you know the, the money is sequestered as far as my income is my income, my spouse's income is my spouse's income, but there might be other things that people want to include in here, such as if a divorce ensues. You know, should there be any support paid uh, if divorce is filed? Let's say the parties are living in, in party A's separate property residence, okay? Uh, things go south, divorce gets filed. Does party B get to stay there, mm -hmm. right? 
And again, without a prenuptial agreement, a court can say under a temporary order, party A, we know that that's your house, but we're going to let party B live there during the dependency of this divorce. We don't want the children involved, that type of thing. We don't want to kick the kids out. So go find another place to live, party A. Oh, and you get to pay for your house while party B lives there. Okay, these things can be controlled again through these marital agreements. Again, if the divorce is filed, you've got thirty days to pack your bags and go find another place to live. Well, I found it interesting. You, you know, you said you could set up um, either support or, or maintenance, mm -hmm. and it is always a question. Well, almost always a question uh, when a couple separates and is going through a divorce is income so you went from a household with one or two incomes and now potentially you're going to have two households with maybe one income or two and everybody is really uncomfortable with am i paying am i not paying so that's just, just another way to work out yourselves what you're going to do without leaving it up to others that's exactly correct that's exactly okay. correct let you plan let you again security yeah security. I, it makes sense well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll learn more about uh, prenuptial agreements, and uh, we'll be right back. Thank you. Securities and financial planning offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor, member FINRA SIPC. The opinions voiced in this show are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, and financial advisor or tax advisor prior to investing. This is Planning for Win, Financial Guidance in Life. I'm Kevin Pinkley, and we're back with Ernie Martin. And we're going to continue talking about the importance of prenuptial agreement. Thank you, Ernie. Very good. Um, one thing I want to touch on, again, we've talked about separating no community estate. You know, what else can a prenuptial agreement do? Uh, I did a little bit of research, very little, but a little bit of research um, before our show here. And the book I was reading discusses rights and duties during the marriage. Now, they didn't really give a whole lot of examples on that. You and I were kind of talking for this show, on maybe some of these celebrity marriages, that type of thing. Uh, I have never done a prenuptial agreement, nor have I ever read a prenuptial agreement that said something like spouse A will clean the house, mm -hmm. you know, these types of things. And again, I don't know if that's what the book is referring to. They basically say, look, it's up to the, the party's creativity. Mm -hmm. um, but for sure, if, if a if the parties are contemplating a marriage where one party is going to be a stay-at-home parent, that's something that really could be beneficially beneficial to the parties to spell that out in, in the premarital agreement. And the reason why that is is because stay-at-home parents tend to sacrifice educations, job experience, all of these things to take care of the kids. And the next thing you know, the youngest kid is now an adult, divorce ensues, and we have a party who is very disadvantaged, okay? Uh, maybe they get some property out of the marriage, maybe not, and if there's prenup chances, not, okay? <laughs> so that party says, well, I'll get spousal maintenance or alimony from the other party. Well, that could be a fight. Mm -hmm. That could be a fight, and, and uh, spousal maintenance uh, typically is not favored by the courts. The party seeking the maintenance has several hoops that they're going to have to jump through to prove that they're entitled to maintenance or the you know, maintenance to be ordered. And even then, the maintenance will be in a, usually a limited amount for a limited period of time. So even if they're successful at proving that they were the homemaker spouse, they may not get what they need, okay? And, and more importantly, the other spouse might have a completely different take. They might say, for 20 years, I begged and pushed and asked you to go out and get a job and contribute to the marriage. So 
to earn to make money because you couldn't make it on one income. You wanted to be the stay-at-home parent, take care of the kids. So that was the cause of the divorce. That was the friction. Okay, well, who's telling the truth here, right? I don't know. But I know this. If it's in that premarital agreement, there's no argument there. And if that premarital agreement says upon divorce, the homemaker spouse is going to get so much money for so much period for so long of a period of time, again, there is no argument there either. The courts will enforce that. I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, what I've experienced is exactly what you're saying. So, and people need to understand, we're dividing the estate that's there. So in a lot of examples, uh, there was a stay-at-home person to raise the kids. It's not always the woman. Um, and as you said, they sacrificed, and the kiddos could be five or the kiddos could be 17, uh, especially in younger couples, and I mean younger by they're not at retirement age. So some of their assets are not available without a penalty. So you got the bulk of your assets in retirement accounts. There's issues about dividing that up um, with tax implications. Uh, it's not accessible to some regards. Money's tied up in the 401k. You have one person that worked outside the home for 20 years and the other one didn't. That is very unequal, but that's y'all's estate. And we're just dividing up your estate. And then having some additional agreements or parameters in there of we've made decisions prior of who's going to work outside of the house and who's not going to 20 years from now, we might have a very different understanding of what that agreement was, <laughs> but we put it in paper that this is how we wanted to structure our household. Uh, because in a lot of cases, someone is disadvantaged coming out of that. Even when assets are divided 50, 50 or 60, 40 or whatever you want to come up with. If someone has the experience as the breadwinner and they are making the income, it's very hard to make up that difference in income. So that's a great idea, and it's frankly probably not used enough, and a lot of people probably don't know about it enough to suggest it. I mean, they can make up their own decisions as a couple, but if you're making this arrangement as a couple, why not go a step further and put it on paper, and then later there's not going to be a disagreement. <laughs> you get no argument from me on that. Yeah. You get no argument from me. Um, just so everybody out there knows, again, uh, do not attempt to make these types of agreements at home. Do not get these agreements from an attorney that has no experience or does not know what they're doing with premarital agreements. Again, they're, they're very tricky. Mm -hmm. They're very technical, uh, and they, they need to be done just so. For instance, um, this gets a little bit complicated, but there's really two defenses to a prenuptial agreement. One we discussed was the unconscionability test, which really isn't a defined term in the Texas Family Code, but we all basically know it's just an oppressive, one-sided type of deal. Uh, the other defense to a prenuptial agreement is what we call involuntariness, meaning one of the parties signed the agreement in an involuntary state. Okay, uh, Without getting into the long history of how that came about, Suffice it to say, there's a lot of little things that can go to prove that something was involuntary. And one of those things is not being made fully aware of what the agreement does, what the agreement, what will happen if this agreement is, is made. Um, so the Texas, the State Bar of Texas, in their forms, have done a very good job of redundancy. So it will say throughout the document, I think it says at least three times that the party's entering this agreement voluntarily, right? Voluntarily, voluntarily, voluntarily. More importantly, there's provisions in there that says the parties have both had an opportunity to visit with counsel, that they've been advised completely, and that they thoroughly understand this document. Again, it makes it enforceable. I run into issues where my client will come into me and I say it's very, very important mm -hmm. that your fiancé has an attorney, okay? Unless your fiancé is a family law attorney who does these things, they are not going to know how these work. So we actually have a choice of paragraphs 
that we have to select one or the other in this form. And one of them says Party B's attorney is Joe Smith, mm -hmm. and Joe Smith has advised Party B on the advisability of this document. Okay. The other paragraph says Party B has been encouraged by everybody to get a lawyer. But Party B has said repeatedly, I know enough, I'm smart enough, I'm paraphrasing here, but I know what I'm doing and I don't need a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Okay? So again, if these documents are challenged on the ground of involuntariness, they're going to have a very difficult road to hoe to show that they signed the same involuntarily. Mm -hmm. when they, they, they signed a statement saying they had the requisite knowledge to do this. And, and again, I always, I, I find it just makes it that much more enforceable when both parties have independent counsel. So. Well, that's some of the pushback we hear sometime, or at least I have, is I'm not going to sign it because I don't understand it, and all it's going to do is benefit the other party, which you're probably more of a participant than you think you are. And, and yes, you need to have someone look over it who knows what they're doing and has experience at it because it's there to protect both of y'all. And no, um, I would never suggest, nor you, that, that one party just willy-nilly sign something without understanding what's in there um, because there's a lot of details in there and language that um, we're not familiar with because we don't use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, it's there for both parties' parties benefit. If you're not comfortable, you can always not sign it regardless of what's going on, but, but definitely you need to have a second pair of <laughs> eyes look at it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, another thing that we do, and I'm going to kind of work my way into another agreement, we do these prenuptial agreements. We like to time them so they're not like right before the wedding, mm -hmm. but they're not so far out that people forgot that they were even supposed to get married. Okay, So my general rule of thumb is basically starting from, say, six months before the wedding's planned up to, say, maybe 30 days before the wedding. That's the that's the sweet spot window in my mind that, that people aren't under duress. I, I had a client once who um, came in and wanted me to prepare a prenup, and I said, okay, when you get married? He said, uh, in a couple days. <laughs> Rush job, huh? Okay, so, you know, we drew up this prenup, and I'm like, look, I'm not looking out for the other side. I'm looking out for my client. But he dropped this prenup on his fiance. I think literally the day of the wedding or the day before the wedding. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about wedding guests are mm -hmm. on their way, uh, you know, all the reservations are made, tons of money spent. The humiliation that that spouse or that fiance would have gone through to say, we got to call this wedding off. You've put a prenup in front of me that I don't agree with. Well, that's a gun to your head. And again, is that a voluntary agreement if she signed it? Mm -hmm. In my opinion, no, not under those facts. So, again, you have to do these things right. You have to do them in a timely fashion. Now, once we do the prenup mm -hmm. and the parties go get married, there is a document called a partition or exchange agreement. That's a postnup. So after the marriage, parties might agree to take their community estate and kill it. Mm -hmm. Assign, you know, I get this property, you get that property. These are now separate properties going forward. One of the practice tips that we get from the State Bar of Texas is 30 days after the wedding, have the party sign this partition or exchange agreement. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of going, now this just sounds like a big money maker for lawyers. <laughs> and I get the two for one deal. I get to sell two agreements. Um, is this really necessary? Well, the idea again is this. The pressure is now off. They're married. Mm -hmm. So, again, if a party says, no, I'm not going to sign that, and you cannot not marry me because I wouldn't sign the agreement, again, it shows a degree of duress that's been going on, as opposed to if somebody says, yeah, I'll sign this partitioner exchange agreement 30 days after marriage, really voluntary at that point. So, again, it's just nuts and bolts. It's not required. It's not a required element in the law. It's just a good practice. Um, people might ask as well, you know, okay, talk to me about postnuptial agreements. Again, why would anybody do one? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, again, there's just a 
but the reasons that people might want to do them. But again, the idea is that somebody probably doesn't like the way that the community estate is done. Mm -hmm. Okay, listen, I'm doing all the work. I'm making all the money. You're not doing enough. I'm fine with staying married to you under those conditions, but I want to protect myself. I don't want the community property laws punishing me because I'm the income earner and the responsible party, which is what they do. Okay, it's, it's a weird thing in Texas. You would think it'd be the other way around. The irresponsible party, the lazy party gets punished. No, no. So again, this posting up agreement has the same effect. It can kill the community estate, separates all the property <clears throat> for the same reasons. For the same reasons, protects wealth, protects heirs, spells out rights and duties. Uh, one other thing that we should touch on, this is important, I want to mention it before we forget. Um, Children, okay, you can make all the agreements that you want about children, how they're going to be raised, all of these things. Typically speaking, the court reserves the right on children to deal with their best interests. So if a prenup contained items about the kids, say how much child support was going to get paid if the divorce ensued. The court always can second guess that again. They won't second guess the, the property rights, but the children's issues, yes. Mm -hmm. So if a person agrees to a ridiculously low amount of child support, that the other party, maybe the custodial party, can go back to the court and say, hey, I want to I want to mark that up, and the court would look at that. Well, no, that's important. I mean, um... There's a whole lot of reasons to have these agreements, and sometimes we've got our ideas of what we need and we don't need, but we need to talk to someone first before we find out what that is. I've learned a lot today, Ernie, and I think we need to have part two to this. Okay. And um, so we can continue the conversation, but we have used our time up today. So I want to thank all the listeners uh, for listening to Planning for Win Financial Guidance in Life. You can join us the last Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m., or you can find us online at Lone Star Community Radio. Thank you, and thank you, Ernie. Hey, thanks a lot for having me again. Hey, one last time, Courier and Martin, this is my firm. I don't believe I gave a telephone number. I might do that. Our telephone sure. number is 281-890-7090-283-1013. can also reach me uh, via email at emartin at courier, C U R R I E R martin.com thank you ernie thank and thank you. you for listening securities and financial planning offered through lpl financial a registered investment advisor member finra sipc the opinions voiced in this show are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual to determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, and financial advisor or tax advisor prior to investing.